Good morning to the Shipwreck pupils. It is your Thursday thought for the day. And as we look forward to coming back to school on Monday morning, uh, it was quite fitting and apt that we actually have a thought for the day where we find out from somebody who's been on the inside of the COVID crisis uh, on the medical side and uh, hear some stories about what it's been like uh, for those very, very much on the front line. So I'm absolutely delighted to have an old Viking uh, with us this morning, Henry Tilney, who I believe left Orchard House in the early 90s. Uh, Henry, uh, thank you so much for sparing your time to speak to, this, uh, to speak to us this morning. Can you just tell the pupils just what your role is uh, at hospital and, and how it has, I suppose, how it was impacted in that first initial COVID outbreak? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a, a colorectal surgeon, which means I'm a gut surgeon. I, I primarily deal with bowel cancer and rectal cancer. That's my specialty. And I'm, I'm the lead um, colorectal surgeon for a, a group of hospitals called Frimley Health, which covers um, Surrey, um, Berkshire and um, some of Buckinghamshire. Um, and so most of my day to day job is, is dealing with bowel cancer, finding it and then and then doing fairly complex surgery to remove it. We use surgical robots and things like that. So it's a world away from um, from 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 what we what landed on us about a year ago. And in terms of when it did land on you, what what sort of reaction was there in terms of how did it impact on on work patterns and how theatres and wards were generally set up? So um, the biggest problem for us was, or the biggest fear for us was, because there were, there were front lines and the front lines, and I'm, I'm not a, a chest or an intensive care consultant. So these are the guys who, who are dealing with the really sick COVID patients. Um, but the problem is, and we've had sort of um, viral um, epidemics before, swine flu and things like that, which, which have been more deadly, but less transmissible. So less, less easy to catch it. The problem this time is that it's so easy to catch and the, the the problem for people in my sort of specialty is that if you operate on somebody who who has covid or gets covid then the chances of not surviving an operation goes up to about 20 percent which is you know for a planned operation is it's immense it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem for us so we had to isolate those areas where we operated on so we moved all our operating theaters to an area where we could keep it safe and clean and then, and then carry on operating. But it meant we didn't operate on cancer for nearly two months. And we had the, we had the stress of trying to manage those, those people and their, and their stress un, understandably, because if you get diagnosed with cancer, you want an operation as quickly as possible. Um, and we're telling them that the safe thing to do is not to have an operation at the moment and, until we can do it in a safe way. So, so it's all of those sort of differences. We had to, we had to deal with the staff sickness and, um, and at one stage about 60% of my team or our, our general surgeons were, were off sick with COVID and so you're doubling up on calls in case you can go in in the morning and then find your buddy you're on call with then goes off sick for, for, for two weeks so it's quite difficult it's, it's been basically a year of not knowing whether you're coming or going. Mm. I mean at what point was it was it right at the, at, right at the very start of it um, that, that doctors and nurses realised just quite the seriousness of, of this particular virus uh, or did it take a little bit of time for the, the, the surge to happen and the numbers to go up for people actually to, to realise that it, it was a very, very unique uh, set of circumstances that we find ourselves in? Uh, I, th I think it's uh, constantly waves of dawning on people, actually. I think it took a few weeks for us to realise that it really was going to be a long, a long run. Um, and I think realising when we got data coming in from China about how much it did affect people if they had planned surgery and how seriously we had to take that. This wasn't just lots of people coming with the flu and some people dying of it. It was something that was going to affect all of our, the, the way that we worked. But um, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that, that this time last year, we, we peaked at about 150 inpatients in my, my the hospital I'm based at. Um, this year, we've just come down from a peak of nearly 450 in about sort of a 650 bedded hospital. And, and if you told us a year ago that that's what we'd have got to, we probably all would have burst into tears and, uh, and not managed to deal with it. But so, so it's probably better we didn't know some of the things. Um, but interestingly, this has felt more organised and better than last time because we've got the processes and the protocols that, that keep us safe. Some of us have been lucky and haven't had the virus and don't really know why that should be. Some of us have had it twice 
um, most of us have had vaccines now, so it's all a bit more comfortable. It's, it, it, I'm sure it's very boring for everyone at school now, the whole sort of thought about it. It's pretty boring for us now. We just wish it would just go away and not come back, but, um, but we have to learn to live with it, I guess. The extraordinary just you know, listen to those stats going from 150 in the first surge to 450, which is, you know, uh, when we start talking sort of multiples, yeah. uh, when the original total was put pressure on the system, what have been the, the, the real learning points? Because I think it, it's similar at school that yeah. actually from the start of January, people just moved seamlessly much more into the, the online uh, learning because sort of they'd been there before they, they uh, I suppose the processes were there. They knew how to how to deliver lessons, how how pupils would react. Um, what what have been the key learning points? Within? So we, we we've done much the same. I mean, a lot of our you know bizarrely, a lot of what we do has has to has to become remote. So a lot of my clinics are now when I speak to people, I do it on the telephone, um, and we only bring people into an, uh, in outpatient clinics disappeared for for weeks, months, and the only way we could contact people was on the phone. Um, and so we've all sort of had to adapt as well. And I think we found that there are some things that work well online. There are some interactions, some people, if you're, in a, if, you're, if you're a busy 50 year old working guy and you want, you know, have an appointment with me, you're probably just as easy wanting to have it on the telephone as you are coming into my clinic and wasting half the morning when I can phone you and you can pop out of the office for a bit. We know, um, and, and so there are some things that lend it themselves to, to, to distant working. And I guess that might be similar at school. There are, there are things that, you know, people might be able to take on online lessons, catching up and things like that, if you're off sick or something like this. So some of these things we'll take with us. I think it's reinforced some of our prejudice about how there are some things that have to be done in person. I mean, it's very hard to tell someone that they've got a life-changing illness over the phone. You, you know, we, we refuse to do it. And I sometimes refuse to do that with a mask actually at the start because I, you know it's not you have to have a personal interaction with people um and however much that might put you at risk you have to you have to think about the the, the right thing for that individual but um so so i think we've learned things and there are there, there are there are there are things that we call silver linings there are things that we take out of it um we moved all our operating into into as i say into two operating theaters um, and that, bizarrely, our length of stay from some of our major cancer operations went down by 30% because they were all grouped together. They weren't being mixed with emergency patients. And um, so some some things have actually got better, it, bizarrely. And the, the actual treatment for COVID itself, um, it, it appears that we are getting better at treating it in yeah. hospital. How again? How has that developed? What is what is being done differently that that now a spell in hospital you know, doesn't doesn't have the 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 definite outcome that that it might have felt it would have you know six nine months ago. So I, th I think the key that people are realising is that getting people onto ventilators. We had this whole thing right at the start, and we've got to buy ventilators. We've got to get Dyson to build new ventilators from scratch, and all this sort of stuff, and and people on their kitchen tables making the, you know ventilators to send whatever it was. Um, and I think people have realized that the key is to try to rescue people before that so they don't need to get onto a ventilator. Once people get onto ventilators, that's a real problem. Um, things like simple drugs like steroids to try to, to try to reduce the severity of the disease and, and, and using different ways of delivering oxygen. All of these things pe people learn so that you can try to intervene. All, everything in life and in medicine is easier if you, if you, tra if you attach, attack something early. Um, and address it earlier on the curve, it's less severe and you're more able to, to, to act. And that, that same in my specialty, it's the same in intensive care. You, you want to rescue, it's better to prevent something deteriorating than rescuing them once, once it's got to it. I think that's really the key of identifying people who need to be in hospital sooner, identify people who don't need to be in hospital and, and realizing that, that people can take responsibility for their own health at home um, and minimise their risk and therefore minimise the risk to their families and, and the wider population. Uh, and obviously, I mean, pupils are facing, uh, you know, I suppose, this fairly uncomfortable situation of wearing uh, face coverings in, in classrooms when they return to us on Monday. Um, yeah. You know, just uh, I suppose that that has been a, a, a difficult part of the job in hospitals as well as operating, um, whether as a, as a surgeon, doctor, nurse, with with face coverings um but i suppose that it's all part of trying to look after the, the wider community 
Yeah, yeah. So we, we you get these, you see these stories in the newspaper and on, online and things about people saying well, you can't possibly wear a face mask because it's proven that if you wear a face mask, you pass out within an hour or something like that. And which just makes us laugh because I spend most of my working life wearing a face mask and I do six or seven hour operations standing up wearing the same mask. And you know, strangely, you don't have whole operating theatres of staff falling over, passing out the whole time. So the masks that people are being asked to wear are actually, you know, it's not like wearing a gas mask. They're not the end of the world. They, 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 you, you can argue to your blue in the face about how much good they do, but that, you know, if, if, if a million people wear a mask, we do things in, 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 in work where the, the, the benefit probably is quite small, but if you do it to a thousand people, and you save the life of one of them by doing it, it has to be worthwhile if it's not doing you any harm. A mask is doing you no harm. It, for some people, it, it allows them the self-confidence to, 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 to go out and to, and to interact. Um, but, but seriously, wearing a paper face mask is not gonna harm anybody. Um, but if it reduces the risk of transmission, even fractionally, then it has to be a good thing. Mm. Now, we, we, uh, we're also obviously interested in some of our pupils will consider medicine as a career, mm -hmm. um, sort of a National Careers Week. Just, um, it, it's been interesting reading the papers. There's been, it appears that there's been sort of increased recruitment for an, an interest levels in medicine as a career, whether as a doctor or a nurse, in the same way as teaching. Seems yeah. to have a bit of an uplift. Um, do you have any advice for, I suppose, any pupils interested in a career in medicine in terms of what the, the key qualities you think they need? Um, so, so I, the, the, the problem with medicine and recruitment to medicine is that it's absolutely um, hung up on A-level grades. And, you know, the, the, some of the best doctors and surgeons I've met had to retake their A-levels to scrape into a university through clearing. And then they've turned out to be the best. Equally, some of the brightest people at medical school that I was with who were getting all the honours, all the awards, made the worst doctors. It's all about, you, you need, um, unfortunately, it's a popular career because it's stable and and what have you um and so you have to have something to select people I, I would say don't get hung up on the grades if you can just about get the grades it's not about being desperately intelligent it's about managing um uncertainty and people who are really intelligent sometimes like certainty whereas my whole life is dealing with shades of gray um and trying to I have to I have to balance that and I have to do what I think is best in a certain circumstance and I know that sometimes I'll be wrong and I have to live with that so it, that's it's that adaptability um the attraction of it I guess is that it's very 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 um you know you go in through one door every time you go through one door there's about 18 doors beyond it that the, the, the pathway that you can go through is is immense um but it's something to go into definitely with eyes wide open um and 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 be under no illusions that it's all going to be sweetness and light because this you know this year has told us that there are some really good things that come out of this year there are some people unfortunately who will burn out because of it some people will retire early um and leave the profession because it's too much for them yeah. and and certainly i think there's been a, a much greater appreciation of the nhs uh over this this course of time uh being on the inside of it has it felt as if you've been part of an enormous team effort. Has there been that sort of, that spirit within teams and within hospitals um, to, to face, you know, this, this huge challenge really you know, head on? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think, you know, we, we're lucky. I, I work in a place that's, that's already got quite a, a strong, it's, there's a military um, element to, to the hospital because it's, um, it's just down the road from Aldershot. Um, so, so it's one of the, the, the military um, base hospitals as well. And because of that, there's, there's quite a strong team ethic in it. And um, uh, we, so we've always been quite tight as, as teams, but this definitely has helped. It's allowed us also to connect between hospitals and between units. So I spend a lot of time now speaking to centers in London and, and, and elsewhere establishing sort of research connections and connections on how we deal with these sort of things. So I think it has brought people together. Um, I think it's, it, it, to be honest, I think it's caused some people to disengage. I think some people have found it too much. Um, and it is it is brought out certainly the best in some people. And but let's not pretend that it, these sort of situations don't bring out the worst in some people as well. Um, 
but but generally there are, there are a lot of positives to take from it. I, I, I wish there was a better way of having done it, but um, but but definitely there are some positives to take from it. Yeah. Uh, and final question: the vaccine. Yeah. Um, the vaccines are they the game changer that that we're we're certainly being led to believe? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that 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 we we expect that we'll have to have a, a vaccine every six months or year, um, certainly in hospital. Um, it's given people. It, it's all these sort of things. It gives people confidence. It gives people the the confidence to to start to mix, to start to interact. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's going to reduce. It's you know our, our emissions are plummeting. So and that some of the vaccine, some of that will be the effect of the vaccine. Um, again, you know, I, it, it's not doing anyone any harm. I don't think. I can't see. I, I've heard no evidence of anyone having coming to harm from it. Some of us have felt a little bit grim for a day or so after having it, but generally it's it's safe. I, I felt worse. We have to have a flu jab every year. I feel worse having had my flu jab than, than having two of these these jabs. It's it's fine, and you, it, it will be the way out of it. Um, and it's just great to be fair that we're in a, in a country that's so far ahead of the game, um, and mm -hmm. and are moving you know moving swiftly through it because I think that's what will allow us to get back to normal life. Right. Well, Henry, thank you so much. As I said at the start, it feels somewhat apt that as we as we hopefully uh, come you know come out of the lockdown and um, with lockdown behind us, as opposed to not having to face it in the future again, it feels apt that that we have somebody from the school community who's actually been involved in it, and that we say thank you. So thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for everything you're doing. Please pass on our thanks from the school here and the school community to everyone that you work with. And uh, it, it is not going unappreciated by, by anybody here. So thank you very much and all the very best to you and look forward to hopefully seeing you at one of our OV functions at some stage in the future. Thank you very much. Good luck with everything.